The CIA is not a bunch of shooters running around picking locks and climbing up the sides of buildings, but it didn't have enough people who could operate in those types of environments. So it started poaching from the military special ops community. That's how I got involved. What is the business model of human trafficking that's attracting so many people to want to go do it? Profits. This is strictly a money play. The misconception is that all human traffickers are men, and that is not the case. Many human traffickers are women. We had intelligence on a human trafficker that was moving children across a border, and they were specifically using those children to test bombs. Yet we have an entire government bureaucracy that we spend billions of dollars fighting what is the illicit trade of legal commodities. Are these guys intimidated by that? They're like, dude, you're not gonna catch me. We know what we're doing, we're smarter than you. They're thinking they're gonna outsmart you every single time. The reason that there are human trafficking victims is because there are human traffickers. So we don't need to spend all of our time focusing on, on rescuing victims. We need to focus on preventing victims by getting rid of human traffickers. My guest today may have one of the most interesting stories you've ever heard, but I'm going to tell you why I'm saying this, because we've had a lot of interesting people on Value So number one, he gets out of high school. While he's in high school, he doesn't want to attend high school because he likes surfing. So he finds out how to hack into the high school's attendance system and shows that he showed up all year long, but he went surfing. From there, he leads to going into the Air Force and becomes a pararescue, which pararescue is comparable to Navy SEAL. Then he goes into the CIA, cannot tell you how long it is because I don't know how long it is, but it's several years he goes into the CIA. And then afterwards, he decides to get out to go fight human trafficking. And all along, he gets a call from Amazon and Vice saying, we want to do a story that's similar to your background because everybody tells us, well, we're about to write you the closest thing to this person. And that movie is Jack Ryan. With that being said, my guest today is Nick McKinley. Nick, how are you? Hey, doing well, doing well, Patrick. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you, man. I mean, when I saw your story and I said, uh, I can't find a lot of things on this guy. And then they said, well, that's the idea. You know, this the idea isn't to have a lot of stuff on the life that he lived. You know, sometimes you can't find a lot of stuff on him. But uh, going back to adults who didn't have the abilities and the intelligence that you had, can you tell us a little bit, how did you hack into the high school's attendance system? I think that's very critical info for us adults here. Yeah, so it was, uh, you and I are uh, about the same age. I believe you're you're about a year older than me. And okay. so, right, it's the 90s and uh, the computer systems weren't quite what they what you would think they were. There's still a lot of like fill in the bubble, right? Put it in the machine. Uh, well, it turns out that you're the same, you're, you're the same bubble and the same sheet every single day. So if you just make sure that that little sensor is covered up, when those sheets get fed in, it shows that you're there. Uh, and with the with the help of a help of a friend who worked in the worked in the front office, and and it was skiing, not surfing, actually. I, so oh, I grew up skiing. in Montana. Got yeah, it. I grew up in Montana. Not not a lot of surfing in Montana. That makes sense. Yeah, there's not the, the beach there. They don't have a fascinating beach in Montana. I've not seen it at least. No, no, uh, lots of lots of rocks on some really yes. cold lakes. Yes, I have friends who live in Montana and they swear by it. Okay, they swear by how amazing Montana is. So, so okay. I mean, uh, uh, your story obviously it's you know a lot of different uh, lives that you've lived and what you've done. But so uh, you get out of school, you go into pararescue. You have a lot of experience there. Take me from pararescue to wanting to become a CIA agent. Did they approach you? Did you approach them? Was there somebody that put an award for you? How did that whole process take place? So they actually called me. Uh, when you're, that, when you're pair rescue, common, by the way, is it common that they call you? I, I think that's relatively common, okay. uh, especially with the wars kicking off the way that they were, you know, uh, contrary to what the, the movies show, the CIA is not is not a bunch of shooters running around picking locks and climbing up the sides of buildings. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong; there are people who do that, but the the kinetic side, uh, right? So the parts of the the CIA where you have to take a physical fitness evaluation and annual shooting evaluations, you know, that is a very 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 small group of people within what is a large government agency. And when the CIA found itself at war on multiple continents within dozens of countries, it didn't have enough people who could operate in those types of environments. So it started poaching from the military special ops community. And 
that's uh, that's how I got involved. Was that pretty common? Like, did you see other friends that also got recruited or no? Oh, it's very common. Very okay. common. I was I was the first I was the first person with a pararescue background to become a staff officer. Okay. But as far as um, what I like to just call, you know, the guys on the team, which is where I started, that, that was incredibly common. Uh, most of my teams, if not all of them, were comprised of uh, military special operators who, who were now working, uh, working for the CIA. Okay. And, and when you got recruited, did you also say you may want to call Johnny or Bobby or Larry because he may also be good? Or is it more or less you call them and rec- how, how does the recruiting process work? So both I uh, both directions, right? I mean, you don't want to you don't want to set your buddy up for some phone call from some random number and him, you, you know, think it think it's a spam call and, and miss the miss a great opportunity. So a number of my friends I, I brought with me from the pararescue teams and and had them uh, had them join me because they were they were great operators and great people to work with. Pararescue CIA, which job did you like more? Oh, that is a tough question. Pararescue was a lot more sporty. Um, uh, when when things when things went wrong and you were getting called to work as a pararescue man, uh, it was it was sporty. Um, a lot a lot more jumping out of planes and and whatnot. But the the thing about the CIA that I really liked was there was very little training time, and that that can also be a bad thing. But there was very little training time. For the most part, you were operational constantly. We were so undermanned. Uh, you're spending 10 plus months a year out of the country, bouncing around the most hostile environments on the planet. And uh, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't time to go take three months, to go take a three-month training cycle like you could in pararescue. It was, it was constantly on the road. How, how, do you, how do you manage that in personal life at the same time? I mean, it's... it's... You know, my buddy I talked to you about, uh, you who was also special ops on what he did, you know, he said, you know, he was on his third marriage wise, you know, that that he went through. He said, it's very difficult to hold it together when you're doing what you do, because you're on the road 10 months out of the year, you don't know where you're going to be at. How did you manage your personal life as a CIA agent or pararescue? Uh, So my first marriage uh, ended in a ball of flames. Uh, I mean, it was, yeah, it it wasn't good. Uh, So so I could say that I actually didn't properly manage my uh, my personal life. Professional life was on a rocket ship. Uh, personal life was an absolute disaster. And uh, so uh, when I joined the agency, they told me, uh, you know, they said, you know, are you sure you want to do this? The unit you're going into has an 86% divorce rate. And of course, the mindset of, of people like us is that, oh, well, that's the other folks. That's not going to be me. Yeah. Right. Everything I'd done to this point in life. I mean, you, you know, there was an eight percent chance I was going to become a pararescue man. Did it. One percent chance I was going to um, get into the agency. Did it. So, oh, 14 percent chance of making a marriage work. Pff, I like those odds. God, yeah, that didn't work out well for me. So uh, so you don't. And and then when I was uh, I was dating my now wife, um, we, we got married after I left the agency. Uh, I, I went a six month period where she saw me for about three days in six months, like physically saw me for about three days in six months. And, and for the first majority of that, I was actually under a cover. So it wasn't until she came to me and said, you know, are you a drug dealer? You know, what's going on? Because this just doesn't make sense. And I'd already been authorized by the agency to break cover and, and tell her, you know, where, you know, where I was, um, or not necessarily where I was, but what I was doing. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, please don't take this as uh, personally, but, you know, I'm about to judge you a little bit, if that's okay with you. <laughs> when I'm looking at you, you look like uh, one of four professions, okay? You either look like a drug dealer, or you look like a hitman, you look like a CIA agent, or you look like Ben Affleck's character from the movie Accountant. Like, you look like you're somebody that you shouldn't mess with. Your eyes have a lot of fire in them, like you're calculating and studying every move of the opponent. You just look like that guy. So... I, I, I don't know if that's an edge or not, but you have a certain look about yourself that uh, maybe was fitting for you to do what you did as a CIA agent. So funny uh, that you say that because the first time I did an undercover operation, I was going through a Middle Eastern country and I was flying civilian. 
and they had a, one of their intelligence agents just sitting there watching people get off the plane. And as soon as I got off the plane, the guy stood up and walked up to me and said, excuse me, sir, would you follow me? <laughs> and showed me a badge and, and uh, you know, what are you doing? And I, you know, fed him my story. And he said, that's great. Uh, you have a 26 hour layover before your next, uh, before your next flight, you can't leave the airport. Uh, well, luckily the airport had a, had a Starbucks, which had about the only padded chair oh, wow. in the whole, in the whole airport. So I sat there, uh, while their security guys just sat there smoking cigarettes, watching wow. me, uh, and I didn't want to go to sleep. That didn't seem like that could go, that could go well for me. So, so yeah, that, that look doesn't really help you out all that much, but it's also really difficult to get rid of. You know, what's crazy. The, the, while we're talking about the guy that's the special ops guy, he's calling me right now. You know, when's the last time I talked to this guy? A long time ago, he's calling me right now. How random is this that he's calling me right now? <laughs> Anyways, I'm not going to pick up because it'll freak him out thinking like we're up to something with him. So I don't want to spook him even more. Uh, but uh, so let, let's go through the process. Okay, so you got pararescue, CIA, then human trafficking. So, mm -hmm. so make the connection between... CIA to wanting to go like what event happened? What did you see? What bothered you? What annoyed you? What inspired you to say, this is what I want to do moving forward? How did that take place? It's not what I wanted to do moving forward. It's what it was my duty to do this moving forward, because this isn't the human trafficking issue is something that once you really understand it, and you understand what's going on, you can't not do something, right? As William Wilberforce said, you can't look away. And so it was a, a sequence of events over a period of about a little over seven years. Uh, but it really culminated, I was in Lashkar, Afghanistan, uh, working for various government bureaucracies. And we had uh, what I like to call smoking gun intelligence. Uh, I was a staff officer working with a JSOC, JSOC counterpart, uh, Joint Special Operations Command counterpart. And we had intelligence on a human trafficker that was moving children across a border, and they were specifically using those children to test bombs. We had video of this. So th this became very, very uh, emotionally charged issue for us. Moving and, children to test bombs? Yeah, to test bombs. What does that mean? Uh, he was he was building pressure plates um, out of uh, materials that you would find at a junkyard. I, I don't want to say exactly what it was and how he was doing it, but he was building pressure plates and he wanted to make sure that those pressure plates would um, would go off if a human stepped on them. But they, he didn't want a, a dog or a cat or somebody to, you know, detonate his bomb. And so as he was testing these, he was he was using he was using young boys. Uh, and, and would literally have them go walk around in a field where he had these pressure plates buried and once, uh, you know, to, to see, to see if they worked. And, and you personally witnessed this? Uh, we, we had video of it. Yes. So we wrote up, we wrote up the Intel, uh, we had, uh, uh we had somebody who was telling us, uh, this stuff and, and we wrote it all up and sent it up the, sent it up the chain and, there was nobody, nobody really cared. Everybody thought, oh, this is very sad, but, but nobody really cared. And that made me curious uh, in, a, in a bad way almost, right? And so when you have that level of security clearance, right? If you work at CIA, you have the highest security clearance you can get, uh, TSSCI with a full scope poly, uh, and there's nothing that's off limits to you. So I got on the computer system and started looking for that magic red door of competence that was fighting human trafficking. And what I learned over a period of years of you know, digging around in classified systems and talking to everybody I knew, and, and you know a bunch of special ops guys, run this experiment yourself. Go ask them how many operations they've ever done that involved going after a human tra trafficker. And what you'll find is that they'll tell you none. There's a bomb maker who maybe was also selling kids on the side or a drug dealer who also was was moving people. But but as far as going after somebody because they were enslaving humans, I, all I know were special ops guys. And I couldn't find a single one who could tell me that they'd done an operation against a human trafficker. And then fast forward a little bit. Why, why not, at, though? Why, why not, though? 
It's not a presidential reporting requirement. So at the end of the day, everybody who works in the government is just a soldier who's doing what the, the bureaucracy at the top, what the administration in charge says to do. And, and, and let me ask you a question. Uh, you're, uh, you're in Texas, correct? I'm in Florida and I just moved here three weeks ago, but I have an office in the, my headquarters is in Dallas, Texas. And my headquarters is in Dallas, Texas, right, I saw on, that. Uh, right on Oklahoma Maple. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so we have a Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. Most people in Texas and their office have alcohol, tobacco and firearms within arm's reach, uh, probably Florida too. Uh, yet we have an entire government bureaucracy that we spend billions of dollars fighting what is the illicit trade of legal commodities. We have a drug enforcement agency. 90% of drugs are legal. More and more drugs are becoming legal, yet we have an entire government bureaucracy that spends tens of billions of dollars a year fighting the illicit sale of legal commodities. The 13th Amendment makes 100% of slavery, because that's what we're talking about, right? Human trafficking is just a very, very very cushy word for slavery. 100% of slavery is illegal, yet who's got the ball on that issue? Who actually does though? I mean, uh, who, who does have the ball on that? So the Department of Justice, uh, great, you know, great agents doing what they can, but there's not enough of them. Uh, you've got Department of Homeland Security. They, they try to do some work around human trafficking, but Department of Homeland Security is very politicized. Uh, right now they've got handcuffs on them on this issue. Uh, you've got state and local law enforcement are really the ones that do the major majority of the heavy lifting. Uh, we were just involved in the human trafficking task force uh, at the Super Bowl. Multiple human traffickers arrested, multiple victims freed. The major majority of the agents we were working with were state and local, right? They were county sheriff's deputies. They were local police uh, who, were, who were doing this work. Yet there's no intelligence center that ties all these people together, that ties all these cases together. There's no software platform that, that becomes the easy button for fighting human trafficking, right? Because a law enforcement officer can't go put handcuffs on a bad guy and start doing intelligence work on a computer at the same time. So while I did was say, well, this is a problem, distill it down to its foundational principles, which are primarily academic, right? It's important that we remove the emotion from this issue and look at it for what it is and said, well, this is a lot like terrorism and fighting narcotics overseas, which quite frankly, the taxpayers should be very proud of the government and the people who are fighting terrorism because we're, we're arguably the best in the world at it. And if, if the, the process that we've learned over 20 years of war works for fighting terrorism, then why won't it work for human trafficking? That's the thesis. And so in 2015, I started Deliver Fund specifically to, to go after that problem and take that counterterrorism methodology and turn it into counter human trafficking. And it, it's been working uh, beyond uh, our wildest imaginations of, of, of how, how well it could have worked. And we're just getting warmed up. I want to I want to come to your system. It will come come back to the system of what you guys do. But I saw an article here. I almost didn't believe it. I said, I'm going to ask uh, and Nick and see what you're going to say about it. This is from a year and a half ago. Business Insider wrote an article, 20 staggering facts about human trafficking in the U.S. First one was human trafficking wasn't illegal, meaning it was legal until 2020. When the Trafficking Victims Protection Act was passed, which made it a federal crime, then President George W. Bush signing the William Wilberforce Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2008. What does that mean? Human trafficking wasn't illegal until 2000. Well, that that's a little bit of uh, of some clickbait. So so it's always been illegal. It's just been called other things, right? Such, such as. Um, so, uh, uh, it was usually prosecuted under the man act or pimping and pandering or what we, what we look at at these, at these, uh, as these, uh, kind of prostitution, commercial sex related, uh, charges, right. So you'd have a human trafficking victim who we have two human trafficking victims who, who work for us at deliver fund. Um, and they'll tell you that every time they got into contact with law enforcement, they looked at them as prostitutes. 
They were being forced to do what they were doing. Um, and so all the Trafficking Victim Protection Act did was, was put a wrapper on what was actually happening. So uh, it, it defined what human trafficking was. So it's not that human trafficking was legal, right? It's still a crime to force somebody to do something. It's just we didn't have it all packaged up into one law. Uh, and so the Trafficking Victim Protection Act said that to, to distill down the language, uh, you are guilty of human trafficking if you are controlling somebody and forcing them to work for your economic benefit or, or the economic benefit of somebody other than themselves, and you're controlling them through force, fraud, or coercion. And what we learned in doing this work is that it's actually, it always starts with fraud. Rarely does this start with force or, or coercion. It, it usually almost always starts with fraud and then becomes force or coercion as the method of control once, once they've defrauded the individual. What, what does that mean? What, once they've defrauded the individual, what, what does that mean? So let's take a case of labor trafficking. Uh, okay. You get a uh, you know, young girl from Vietnam uh, answers an ad in uh, you know, Ho Chi Minh City for uh, nannies in the United States. And she thinks she's going to come over here and, and be a nanny for some wealthy family. And they interview her and make her think all of this. And then they get her over here, they take her passport, and they stick her in an apartment brothel in New York. Uh, that's, that's what I mean by fraud. Uh, you, we saw the same thing out of Eastern Europe. There were uh, nurses uh, who were being recruited out of Eastern Europe and, uh, and, and the Balkans area as well. And they were bringing them over here, telling them they were going to be nurses in the United States, took their passports, stuck them in an uh, apartment brothel. Uh, and then you have, even here in the United States, because major majority of human trafficking victims are, are U.S. citizens who are being trafficked by U.S. citizens and sold to U.S. citizens, right? This is a U.S. problem. Uh, so you get a, a, a young girl at high school, befriends the older guy that she meets at the mall. He showers her with gifts, gains her trust, and then finally gets her to a party, drugs her. You can use your imagination from there. And now she's, you know, psychologically uh, destroyed and he's got control of her for life. So, um, I mean, just thinking about it, it's, uh, um, you know, some movies do a good job painting the picture of what happens with this. I think even recently, one of them was Rambo. I, I, I never thought the direction of the story would have gone with Rambo was about human trafficking. I don't know if you saw the movie, Ram oh, you're not a movie guy. I just realized. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see yeah, it. it. The movie was uh, about human trafficking on what happened to his niece uh, with what Sly had to do, go out there and try to save her. But by then it was too late because that drugged her way too much that she couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. uh, $150 billion out of your industry. It's a pretty big industry, $150 billion out of your industry. When I see stats, different places, $99 billion, $150 billion global, all these numbers. What is the business model of human trafficking that's attracting so many people to want to go do it? Profits. That's, 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 it, this is, this is strictly a money play for these human traffickers. Um, it, it, it's a very low risk right now. We've been, we've been increasing the risk, but it's very low risk. Uh, you know, if, if you're moving a kilo of cocaine, a drug dog can kick that, can, can pick that up. We have sensors that can pick that up. If you're moving uh, some scantily clad girls in the back of a car and you're maintaining the speed limits and your brake lights are good, um, nobody knows that you're moving slaves. And so, I mean, imagine if all of your employees, you didn't have to pay them. Well, what just happened to your profit margins, right? And, and so that's why, that's why they're doing this is it's just sheer slavery. It's an, uh, predominantly, there is forced labor that happens in the United States, but the predominant business model is commercial sex. But at the end of the day, that's just the type of labor that the human trafficker is selling. Uh, and so some, some woman that and, and it's also it, it touches um, the LGBTQ community, it touches, it touches all these vulnerable populations. They are exploiting these people, these human traffickers are exploiting these people by making them work and not paying them. And so their 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 profit margins are essentially, you know, 80, 90, 95 percent. What, what is the, uh, uh, have you guys noticed a pattern or a trend of a human trafficker 
So somebody who is doing it, what is a typical pattern? Are you noticing a consistency with a pattern or is it just a criminal? That's all it is. They just kind of want to make money. Any kind of patterns you guys have found? Yes. Uh, so we, we build our own software. Uh, we, we have our own data collection and we, we have those patterns. We actually sit on top of the largest human trafficking database in existence, uh, largest and cleanest. Uh, we've got over 70 law enforcement agencies around the United States that are all kind of working together on this database. And so what that, what that means is we've been able to take this very, very clean data and start analyzing it for patterns. And now we're getting to the point where our software is actually just going to be able to actually can bring human trafficking to our attention. So we know exactly how they work and really their Achilles heel you know, I, I talk about this on, on other podcasts and people say, well, Nick, how can you talk about what you're doing? Don't you need to be secret about it? Nope, I don't. Because if, if your business model is that you need to be secretive about something, well, that's not scalable and that's, that's not going to work. Uh, human traffickers have to advertise. If customers want to find, you know, a date for the night, so to speak, right, that usually the customers think it's prostitution uh, and they, they want to find that girl, they go to the internet. That's where this is all advertised, because if they put the girl on the street, law enforcement can find it, right? Law enforcement has the right to go approach her and, and talk to her. She might rat the trafficker out. So it's a lot easier to keep her locked into a locked in a hotel room and advertise her online. And there's there's dozens of websites online. I mean, you could you could get to these websites if you know where you're going. This is not in the deep and dark web. This is the front facing Internet. Uh, the big famous one that everybody was aware of uh, that the DOJ took down was Backpage.com, uh, and so you go to those you go to those websites, you schedule a date with a girl. Uh, there's a human trafficker who's advertising that girl online, and and the transaction happens. So that's the Achilles heel of of the whole human trafficking market in the in the United States is that it's predominantly online, and so. If you're online, that means you're leaving a trail, and we're really good at 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 uh, chasing down those trails and seeing where they lead. So I just looked at Backpage.com. Founder Michael Lacey. Who was Michael Lacey? Uh, he is currently uh, under house arrest. Um, he was actually uh, so the Village Voice, which was a publication out of New York, right from the '70s, I think. Um, yeah. They had the back page when the back page was right. It was a lot of your uh, your prostitution, massage parlors, a lot of human trafficking, uh, and then they took they took that back page of the newspaper and took it online and started selling one dollar advertisements um, to people who were predominantly engaged in the commercial sex industry, and uh, everybody uh, their their whole C suite was arrested. They all pled guilty. Uh, Michael including Lacey, himself, including uh, no, himself. Michael Lacey. And, um, I can't remember the other founder's name off the top of my head, but they're fighting the charges cause they're old. Um, and you know, they're, they're going to come out of prison in a pine box if, uh, if they get convicted or should we say when they get convicted? So they uh, are, how did, how did, how did the law enforcement find out that Backpage was doing this behind closed doors? Uh, we, we decided, we deliver fund decided to make Backpage our hobby. Uh, oh, so we, you did that. You went after Backpage because I see 2018 and you've been around for six years. So we were uh, we were one of many, many members of a, of a team. Uh, the 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 real credit goes to federal law enforcement and uh, and actually uh, Texas AG's office. They did a phenomenal job. Uh, there's some law enforcement in Arizona that was working the case as well. But when it came when it came to kind of coordinating a lot of the intelligence work and, and passing that off, uh, we did uh, we did a lion's share of that for sure. So Carl Ferrer, who was the CEO of Backpage, I believe that's the name you were trying to think about. It, yep. did, did they know that human trafficking was taking place and they kind of looked the other way? Is that what the challenge was? Yes, they absolutely How did they know did. that? How did they know that? Because it's egregious. Uh, I mean, and any 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 person who was looking at what was happening uh, on their platform, uh, I mean, they they knew what was happening. And, and the DOJ actually has communications. If you research the back back page case, you'll find that's why they pled guilty is because they were literally talking about it on their on their corporate communications. Uh, so they have the servers, they have everything that they were talking about, and they have them talking about the fact that they knew this was happening. 
Um, and they were, they, they were, let me give you an example of the kind of thing that was happening there. There was a, a, a 12 year old girl who was advertised by a human trafficker on Backpage, right? So you could tell in a, along with a photo um, and he put her age as 12 years old. Well, Backpage's moderators changed the age to 18 and then let the ad go what? forward. Come on. Absolutely evil. I mean, just, just evil. So, so I'm looking at alternative to back page. So I'm assuming you target craiglist.com, OLX, Facebook, Kiji, free ads. W what are the websites you target that can do exactly what Backpage did? Uh, so I'm not going to give the names of the, of the uh, websites that we target actively. Uh, these websites are very profitable and I'm not interested in, uh, <laughs> I'm not interested shout in, out. Okay. in that fight. Yeah. Um, and, and more importantly, uh, people who don't know where to go, telling them where to go. Uh, but there's, uh, there's about 32 sites right now that are, are the primary sites where the source data comes from. Uh, and we, we are actively, uh, we're actively collecting from all of those sites. So let me ask you this, when you're dealing with a company that say they don't know that that is taking place and then they find out based on the proof you show, because I think we, your model isn't you go attack them. Your model is you go team up with the 70 or 60 law enforcement organization that you work with. You no longer kick the doors down. You give the intel to those to go kick the doors down. I think if after doing some research on your business model, that's your business model, right? Correct. Okay. So, so you find out a company that's a real company, they have somebody who's a human trafficker leveraging the the, the, the clientele, the traffic that's coming to that website, do you then contact them and have the business work with you to get more of that data for you to pass down to law enforcement? Like, do, do the companies now help become a teammate with you? That's always the first, uh, that's always the first place that we start. Um, so we have very, very uh, publicly recognizable partners, uh, publicly traded companies that we work with to help them keep human traffickers off of their platform. But a lot of these websites, they specifically moved their business operations overseas into non-friendly, non-U.S. or uh, non-friendly, non-extradition U.S. country or uh, uh, countries, so it. that they're not subject to U.S. jurisdiction. Same guidelines. That's same kind of part of the same problem. Way. So, how do you battle that? Right now, there's nothing we can really do on that. Um, we we have a way of uh, of diluting their market, uh, which we don't talk about publicly, to make it so that it just complicates their business. Right? It just it just makes it so that the 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 trafficker can never quite get his product in front of the customer, and the customer can never quite find a real product. So we have ways of of complicating that a little bit. Um, but primarily, the way that the way that we deal with that is uh, is by getting these human traffickers arrested, and that's that's one one key thing that we need to focus on is in order to have a human trafficking victim, which is the reason we're doing this, right? Uh, human traffickers are bad people; they're going to do bad things. Um, there's nothing Nick can do about that. However, they are they're exploiting people; they're harming children, and so. The reason that there are human trafficking victims is because there are human traffickers. So we don't need to spend all of our time focusing on, on rescuing victims. We need to focus on preventing victims by getting rid of human traffickers. Makes sense. Yeah, that, 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 that makes sense. And uh, do you, so, so sometimes when you're, you, you guys have to wrestle with pigs quite often, right? Yourself, like you, you have to get dirty yourself in order for you to be able to uh, make their life a living hell. I know, I know you can't say yes or not, but your world is not like, Hey, let's take the proper route. And you know, let's, you have to make their life a living kill by playing some of their games against them. No. So not so much playing their games against them. Um, you know, everything that we do is reviewed by legal counsel. Um, we work with prosecutors love us, uh, and we wouldn't be able to we wouldn't be able to do the things that we did if our if the work that we put together was not admissible in court, all right. And and everything that we do is admissible in court. We're open to discovery. It's uh, it's a very very above board operation. Um, but what we do is we infiltrate their communications. Uh, and I hope there are human traffickers out there right now listening to that and wondering 
whether or not that person they're communicating with online is actually one of my intelligence analysts. Uh, we infiltrate their communications where they're, they're, they're sharing best practices. They're, um, they're, they literally will, will coordinate with each other to say, hey, you know, the Super Bowl is coming to my town. Um, I've only got three girls. I need, I need other guys to come down and bring more girls so that we can service what is a market opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a, a, a key differentiator in the way that we fight human trafficking is we fight it as a market. We fight it through economics, where in your business and in my other business, I'm always trying to reduce risk, right? Where I was trying to mitigate it. What our whole, what we do at Deliver Fund is we increase market risk for the human traffickers to cut into their profit margins and make it harder for them to do business. Yeah, but human traffickers kind of like, uh, obviously, you'll see where I'm going with this. Uh, uh, Nick, only 7% of people are going to graduate from Prairie Rescue. Watch me do it. Only 1% is going to become a CIA. Watch me do it. 86%, which is only 14% of people that do what you're doing right now. Their marriage ends up at a divorce. Oh, if I beat 7% and 1%, I'm going to beat 14%. That's not a problem. I got it, right? Are these guys intimidated by that? They're like, dude, you're not going to catch me. We know what we're doing. We're smarter than you. They're thinking they're going to outsmart you every single time. Because No. And, and here, here's the misconception. You know what I'm saying, right? You know yeah, what I'm no, saying? Yeah, no, okay. absolutely. But here's yep. a misconception about human trafficking, right? People will say that human trafficking is the largest growing criminal enterprise. It's just not true. Uh, narcotics and guns, especially with all the wars going on around the world, uh, narcotics and guns are, you know, illegal gun running is, is hands down the largest illicit commodities. Uh, the next is uh, people will say, well, you can actually make more money from, uh, you know, from selling human trafficking victims than you can from narcotics or guns. That is also not true because you can have a shipping container full of cocaine or AKs sitting in a port somewhere and you can leave it there for two years and those the drugs and the guns are worth just as much as they were uh, when you put that container there you can't do that with people right people have people require overhead you have to house them you have to feed them you have to keep them in at least good enough condition so that customers want to spend some time with them uh, and that's 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 the Achilles heel that cuts into the profit margins of of human traffickers. And so most of your smart criminals, I mean, your your people who would be curing cancer, were they not criminals? Um, most of them are into some type of organized crime around either narcotics or guns or, you know, ripping off banks, credit card fraud, those types of things. It's actually uh, in, in a there are exceptions to this rule, but it's it's not your smartest criminals who are human traffickers. There's also a piece here, you know, I, I saw in doing research that you you've interviewed many members of, of, of the mob. My guess is if you go ask them what they think about human trafficking, they're going to say that's over the line. And if we found somebody doing that in our organization, they were going to end up in a box. Um, and that's what happens with a lot of these these criminal enterprises too. Is uh, you know you'll have you'll have uh, uh, you know narcotics criminal enterprises who aren't aren't going to allow their people to start harming children. So so even within the criminal underworld, there's there's an ethic line when it comes to children that people won't cross. Oh, there's no question about it. <laughs> Uh, and they even had a code, uh, La Cosa Nostra, they wouldn't touch drugs, although several people did, but that was part of their code as well. Uh, so not the smartest criminals. Okay. So not the smartest criminals, meaning they're not trying to play the, oh, I'm going to beat the odds of 7%, 1%, 14%. So you're saying they're scared? Like if you scare them, they run away like a little cat? Is it, are, they, are they scared criminals? Like, can you scare them away from the industry or no? No, not really. Okay. Uh, so, most so, of so them... This is all they know. Okay. So business model to catch them. I'm just, I'm not in your world, but I'm just thinking about it. So if it's Super Bowl and these are the girls that are doing it, you know, they're coming in and hey, customers go, people are going to, they're going to go online to get somebody. Hey, I had one too many drinks. I only call somebody. How do I find somebody? Hey, we got, so is the business model to go to the Super Bowl and go find those sites and call 100, 200, 300, 400 of them, then you send your guys to go meet with the girls. And then you tell the girls that you're willing to help them out and 
interrogate them to get a feel if they are working with somebody and then you have them come with you. You can't get all 300 of them because they're scared for their lives that that, you know, individuals, it's the relationship with the pimp and the prostitute. And you know how that relationship, it's fear-based. Absolutely. Then you convince a percentage to go with you and then you backtrack, giving them protection and safety. And then through backtracking, you find out who it is and then you go track them down. But at that point, they know that you've taken some of their people. So they're probably on the run. Is that part of the business model? At least not yours, because you're not the one that does that. You just give intel. Is that one part of the business model that the law enforcement does or no? Yeah, so that's, that's exactly what law enforcement does. Uh, law enforcement, you know, gets in front of the girls uh, because you got you to have a witness, right? You got you to have, have proof. Uh, gets in front of them and says, hey, you know, and usually a lot of times using our intel, here's what we know about you. We know that you, you and that girl over there are actually all connected. And we know that you're run by this guy. We know that he's sitting in a car in the parking lot. Um, all we need you to do is, is tell us that he's holding you against your will. And, uh, and we got this. Or in many, many cases, what, what can happen is, uh, you know, the human trafficker is controlling the girl. So he'll go drop her off at, at whatever venue. And as, as, uh, as he's dropping her off, law enforcement swoops in and, uh, and catches them together. So, so you, you do have those types of cases, but some of these are very, very insidious. Uh, we had a case in the Southwestern United States where the girl was on her own. So we thought she was a human trafficking victim. We were sure she was a human trafficking victim. And our analysts uh, are really, really good. Yet when the law enforcement wrapped her up, she was on her own. Well, after questioning her for about 20, 30 minutes, she broke down crying and the human trafficker had her baby and was threatening to hurt her baby and had her baby yeah. in another city and that was the handle he was using to control Makes her. Sense. Makes sense. What a way to hold somebody hostage. Um, so how much does the U.S. government, to, to, to fight what you guys are fighting, you can't do it with a couple million dollars. How, how much is the U.S. government putting behind this? Like how much are they saying, we are going to fight human trafficking and we're going to put up this much money and then go and help certain organizations to you know, accelerate the process of eliminating, if not as much as we can to get rid of human trafficking? <laughs> so the U.S. government spends less than a dollar per human trafficking victim globally. Globally, which is globally, it's a 20 to 40 million people globally. So you're telling me it's only 20 to 40 million dollars a year? The, the last numbers we had are that the U.S. government spends 22 million dollars a year fighting human trafficking, like specifically dedicated to fighting human trafficking. So 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 let me ask you why. Uh, so which which president has been the most is it because it's an uncomfortable topic for presidents to campaign behind that no one wants to talk about because it's you know it's a little bit of an uncomfortable topic you know to talk about human trafficking why haven't presidents campaigned behind something like this and made it an issue for people to say yeah i think we need to put i mean right now we just did 1.9 trillion dollars right okay mm -hmm. What's the big deal if you put 10 billion behind something like this? This is actually emotionally painful to the parent that lost their kid and they go through this. And, you know, when someone goes through this to get them back to living a normal life and rather than wanting to commit a suicide, the percentages are so high that very rarely do you get them back to being normal. It's a very it's a big fight that they have and it takes years. It doesn't take three, six months. And many times it takes three, four, five years to get him back to saying, okay, this is not your fault. You didn't do this. It's okay. You got to move on. Why wouldn't the government want to fund this and put some money behind it? That's a great question. And I don't have an answer for that. This is, uh, this is such a problem. Uh, and it, it kind of goes back to what I said in the beginning. Like we have whole government bureaucracies that spend tens of billions of dollars to fight legal, the, the illicit sale of legal commodities. Yet we don't have a single government agency that is focused on this issue. And why? You know, why, when I was at the CIA, did we have this intelligence on a human trafficker in another country? And was there nowhere to send it? You know, why is, why is Delta not being sent in to go take down, you know, major human traffickers overseas? I mean, these, these are legitimate questions we need to be asking of our politicians and our policymakers to say, why is this not a priority? And, and, and human or uh, 
politicians do campaign on this issue. I mean, if you if you look at it, they talk about it, but but show me the money. If it, if it's if you're serious about it, right? The the uh, the Bible says where your where your where your treasure lies, there your heart will be also. Uh, so show me show me the money that we're actually spending. Uh, we've seen lots of bills come through saying that this much is going to be spent or that much is going to be spent, but they all go unfunded. So uh, how how united are all of you on the private side, meaning someone like you, a Tim Ballard, a, you know, there's, there's men, there's a good amount of you that are you guys all pretty united or is it a pretty competitive environment or is it all we're united because we're fighting the same fight? It's united. We're, we're fighting the same fight. Uh, you know, what we do at Deliver Fund, we're the only organization in the world that does what we do. Uh, and, you know, the, the other folks out there, be it International Justice Mission is a great example. You know, we work, uh, we work closely with some of their folks. They're the only group that does what they do. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is a phenomenal organization, right? A lot of people don't realize that actually is a private nonprofit that John Walsh started uh, around the missing kids issue. They, uh, we work very closely with them. Uh, and so, so you, you have all these various groups that kind of do different pieces of it. You know, one of the one of the key components of the fight against human trafficking is the restoration homes. You know, these are people who have started their started nonprofits to provide restoration services to uh, to human trafficking victims. Uh, and so, so it does get into this environment where you know, especially if you have people with really really good hearts but no business experience or no business sense, and they don't have the right business people wrapped around them. I've been incredibly blessed in that I've had big business brains, you know, really come in and help us out, not only with money, but, but to show us where the potholes in the road are. And so on the restoration side, you have a lot of organizations that are just trying to do the right thing to help these victims, but they don't know how to do it in a repeatable, scalable way. Uh, so, so, so you and Tim, Tim Ballard have a relationship, like you guys do stuff together. No, no. I, as I understand it, they predominantly focus overseas. Okay. Um, you're more, you're more domestic and overseas. No, we are, we are only domestic. You're um, only domestic. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. So, you know, give us a, um, I mean, the, the, where I was going with this was the following, where I was going with this is, how often have you guys gone in front of Congress and made a case? How often have you guys gone to DC and made a case? How often do you guys unite together and make a case? How often have you guys gone and gotten celebrities behind some like this to make a case? How often uh, have we, you know, rallied people if, if, if uh, save the world, uh, uh, save, uh, uh, make it a better place to you and, uh, you know, the song back in the days, he, right, uh, what right. was a, you know which one I'm talking about. I do. This, they didn't want to get paid for. It. They're just like, look, we're doing it for a good cause, and there are people that are willing to do that. Who, who's who's leading that today? I know I know uh, Ashton Kutcher did some stuff, and he mm -hmm. was pretty active, and you can tell the pain when he was speaking about it. So I do. I don't see this as a Democrat, Republican, or Independent thing. I just see this as a listen. This ain't politics. This is kids. Period. And all you need to know to uh, 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 emotionally be connected to this is to have a kid or a younger sibling. As long as you have a kid or a younger sibling and you emotionally experience that, you're like, Look, no brainer, I'll support it. How can I support it? How come no one's been able to get in front of the government for the government to say, we're going to put a billion, two billion, five billion, ten billion behind it? You know, it's funny. Uh, we were uh, actually coordinating with Ashton Kutcher and, and uh, I was on a call with him and you know, he, he goes in front of Congress. Um, I was asked to speak in front of Congress three times and every time two days before they canceled. Why is that? Um, you know, uh, Yoda Soros at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who's the chief legal counsel there, uh, she does, you know, she goes and, and talks to policymakers on a routine basis, but National Center for Missing and Exploited Children gets $60 million a year from the federal government. So maybe and now and that's predominantly focused around the missing kids issue, and that's not human trafficking specific. So so children who go missing, you know, foster kids like I was a foster kid. Right. I got lucky. 
Um, I very easily could have been uh, a, a human trafficking victim. Uh, kids the highest age, percentage, by the way, foster kid is 60%. It's a, it's yep. a very big number. Yeah. Um, missing kids. Uh, National Center mis- uh, estimates that once a child goes goes missing or, or runs away within the first 48 hours, they'll be a t- they'll be uh, approached by a human trafficker because these human traffickers know where to find them. And they're and they're cruising around looking for them. And so there you are, a, you know, a, a runaway teen in in uh, Seattle in the winter. And you're sitting on a park bench and people think that you're just a, a homeless team. And, and if you ran away, then I guess you are a homeless teen at that point. Human trafficker comes by with a warm car and says, hey, you want some food? Get in. Yeah. So so then my next question would be, you know, I was on a flight one time. I think it was 14 years ago. It was 06, 07. I was on a flight one time and me and my uh, uh, friend were sitting next to each other. And and she looks at the girl sitting in front of us and says, Pat, take a look at this. It seems a little weird. And I said, what do you mean? It said, look, you know, every time I look at her face, she looks scared. I'm trying to talk to her. So she waited for the guy to go to the bathroom. And, and the guy was probably 62 years old. And she was probably 12, 13 years old. She looked like she had a little pouch, like almost being pregnant. And she started talking to her. Who is that man sitting next to you? How are you, sweetie? You know, trying to kind of, and she talks to her and she's like, I can't talk to you. And she's like, well, is this your daddy? I can't talk to you. And, and I'm listening. I'm like, dude, this, this girl is frightened on this mm-hmm. flight, right? So, so I follow the guy. I'm not trying to make a scene. I follow him. Okay, so I'm trying to start a conversation with him. And I look at him. I'm like, yeah, something's wrong with you, buddy. There's something very weird. With you. So I, I started, hey, so tell me, where are you guys from? You know, I'm just trying to start a conversation. And Hey, can you leave us alone? I'm like, can you leave us alone? Who the hell says, can you leave us alone? I'm like, hey, it's totally fine. So is that your daughter? None of your business. Yes, that's my daughter. I'm like, even if that's your daughter, you're 62. Okay, fine. We're living in America. Times are changing. Maybe you're... Sh-. So then I go up to the um, flight attendant. I said, listen, uh, this, this is a little bit... Weird. 42 years of me living, I've never done this in my life. You know, I'm convinced this guy was a dirty guy and I wanted to take it on my own, but I had, you know, friends I knew in the flight. I'm not trying to make a, you know, but at the same time I said, you know, do you guys have any agency people on the flight? I know typically on every flight, there's somebody that's an agent, you know, that's on, I don't need to know the answer to the question, but there's a very weird situation going on here. There's this man sitting here and this girl and my friend and I started talking to them and she's scared for her life. And I feel like I have to do something about this, but I'm not an agent. I don't do anything. Can you please tell your management? So she said, let me see what I can do. So they come back. They look, start talking to him. At this point, he's thinking that I, because he looked at me like pissed off even more. And I really, at this point, I'm not, I'm really don't care at this point what's going on. So he goes back, she goes back and tells the other person. So now everybody's kind of trying to find out what's going on. And I said, do you mind, you know, not letting them get off the flight and have some agents coming on board and kind of doing what they're doing. Says, so, sir, we have it from here. Let us take care of it. We make sure we, we want to reassure you we're going to do something. I left. I waited. I, all I know is the guy and the girl didn't get off and they were kind of, somebody was talking to them. I don't know what happened there, but you know, that was just my gut. I may have been wrong. Never felt like that before ever in my life. I'm a pretty intuitive guy. I'm around a lot of people. I travel very regularly and it, it, it felt very, very weird. What, what can, so there's two directions I'm going with this. On one is I'm talking as a citizen. What can I do if I see something that's wary and something just doesn't look right? What, what can we do to help? Because we got, you know, 350 million people, say 40 million people living in America, human traffickers, it's not a big number. Say it's in the thousands. But we got a lot of other adults that are out there looking all this other stuff. What signs can we look for and what can we do in that moment, you know, to maybe potentially help one girl that is going through the mess that she's going with a trafficker? So the answer to that question actually goes right back to the story you just told. Uh, the, you know, people say, well, what should we look for? Uh, well, people uh, will tell you that, you know, you look for a girl with a, a crown tattoo on her neck. Well, that's, that's pretty old. That's about 20, that that's about 20 years ago that traffickers were what, doing what's that. The crown? What's the crown? Uh, they, they, they put a crown, they mark their victims. 
Um, they used to mark them like on their neck or on their face until they figured out that it's pretty easy for law enforcement to figure out. So they stopped doing that. They still do mark them, but usually in a place that you can't see. Uh, and uh, but when you see something that just doesn't make sense, right, and especially when it when it involves fear, uh, we all know what fear looks like. I mean, we can see it in other people. It's a, it's a survival instinct uh, that allowed, you know, mankind to proliferate, say, hey, you know, I'm afraid because there's a lion over there. So we all know what it looks like. And so when you see that, you did exactly the right thing, which is you want to tell the next level of authority that you can, right? So in this case, it was, you know, it was the, uh, the crew at the airline. If, uh, if, if it's not the crew at the airline, it's going to be the airport security. It's going to be a law enforcement officer. It's going to be calling your county sheriff, uh, all of those things. Uh, but then you get this problem with, too much data. Because that law enforcement officer who's a, a human trafficking detective, well, that's only one of their jobs. They're also working traffic two days a week. And they're also doing something else because law enforcement is undermanned uh, as much as anybody in the government. So that's where we come in, in that we provide technology software. So it connects those cases across the country so that those, those law enforcement officers can log into our system and say, all right, you know, has any of the information that this that this girl gave me or this guy gave me, has anybody else in law enforcement seen this before? And so they'll search it and, oh, yep, sure enough, there's a guy, uh, there's a detective in Nebraska. All right, let me call that detective in Nebraska and see see what's going on, right? And so so getting people to report things, I mean, even if you don't, I mean, you don't know it's a human trafficking victim. It could be something completely different. It could be, you know, the the girl's parents had died in a car crash. And this is an uncle she doesn't know very well, who was the last of kin who now is taking, you know, taking her on. I mean, you have no idea. But the point was that something wasn't right. And so you told somebody. And that is exactly what the public needs to do and err on the side of caution. Err, right? You just err on the side of caution. Like this could be a human trafficking problem. It could be a kidnapping problem. There was something going on. So we need to tell somebody. You know, uh, uh, again, I'm not in your world, but if I'm in your world, you know, I think speed is critical, right? Mm -hmm. Call to action is critical. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I understand research data, all of that, but that's to hunt down the ha trafficker, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're in an opportunistic moment, you know, um, there has to be because once once they're gone, they're gone. Your opportunity is gone. They're, they're, you know, how, how much does speed play a role in catching traffickers when you see an opportunity to execute immediately? Meanwhile, the law enforcement agencies you're dealing with, maybe that's not at their top of their priority. So what happens when you give in intel? Do they execute immediately? Or it's like, oh, we can't do it today. We're so busy. We'll do it tomorrow. How does the level of speed to call to action, I'm gathering information, I got it. How, how fast does execution happen, executing the data that I got to go catch this guy? What have you noticed yourself? Not near fast enough. Uh, yeah, law enforcement always wants to execute on it immediately, but a great example is at the Super Bowl, uh, we had over 700 intelligence packages go out uh, during a Super Bowl operation. I, if you took every single law enforcement officer in the Tampa area, area and solely dedicated them to the human trafficking problem, they wouldn't have been able to get to the bottom of it. And, and that's, a, that's a very harsh reality of how big this problem is. And it's gotten this big because we never, we never took combating it seriously. So now uh, we're at the Super Bowl. My analysts, uh, they know many human traffickers who showed up at the Super Bowl and then left the Super Bowl with their girls. Well, Quite frankly, that sucks. But we have all that data. And now we know where they're going because they're advertising. So we know where they're going to end up. The computers will let us know when they settle. And then we can call law enforcement in that area and say, hey, these guys were just in the Super Bowl. And the reality is sometimes law enforcement says, hey, we actually don't have anybody who deals with human trafficking. We don't want anything to do with that. Um, and in which case, why, we're like, why, all right. Why? Why do they say that, though? Because they're not funded for it, right? Go to go to your local. You, I'm sure you know some folks in law enforcement. Uh, go to your police chief and say, "Hey, 
um, show me, show me the budgets for your, your narcotics unit, for your gangs unit, for your property crime unit, and for your human trafficking unit. And what you'll find is that their gangs unit is fully funded. Narcotics unit is fully funded property crime that touches commercial real estate, uh, which touches their donors, the mayor's donors. So guarantee you that's funded. And many times I'll tell you, oh, we actually don't have a human trafficking unit. We have a detective who does something else who, if a human trafficking case comes along, they go ahead and, and, and they deal with it. So you, you obviously the idea of defunding the police just even hurts us even more because you need funding to be able to execute on some of these things. So a uh, uh, question question for you on on uh, how many total traffickers are there not victims but how many total traffickers if you can estimate are there in america today i would estimate it around the oh, man it'd be hard 25 to 50,000 mark what's the uh, i'm sorry go ahead and and the way we get that is uh, again the, we're talking illicit underground commodities right illicit underground networks very very difficult to get good data on that but the National Center for Missing and Explo Exploited Children estimates that about 100,000 children a year, children, um, enter the human trafficking market. In America. Uh, in America. And these are, American, these are American citizens. This is not lethal weapon and there's you know, Chinese coming yeah. in over shipping containers or the movie Taken, um, right? This is, this, is, uh, this is our sons and daughters that are being targeted primarily on internet platforms, uh, social media, uh, gaming consoles by human traffickers and uh, groomed, which is what they call it, into their, into their business enterprise. How many total victims? If it's 25 to 50 traffickers, how many victims total? Uh, so we, we don't know. We know that about 100,000 children a year enter the cycle. We know that the average life of a human trafficking victim is seven years. Uh, so you can, do some, you can do some fox and rabbit uh, economics on that pretty quick to figure out that it, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of, of human trafficking victims. If you do 700, if, you do 700, if that 100,000 stays, but the next year the 100,000 stays, for seven years and the next year. So out of a seven year period, you're at 700,000, but they're rolling up. So it's about 1.4, 1.23 million. Okay. What yeah. is the worst example we've made of human traffickers? The worst example? Yeah. Meaning what, what is the crime of a human trafficker and what, ha how have we publicly, um, you know, made an example of them to punish them in a way where others sit there and say, did you hear about what happened to Johnny? Yeah, I don't know, man. They're cracking down very quickly. They just got another one and another one and another one and another one. How do we advertise the human traffickers are getting caught and how bad of a punishment are we passing down to them so others are kind of being a little bit more hesitant about what they're doing? So the minimum mandatory sentence for human trafficking at the federal level is 15 years. That's it. Yeah. That's the minimum or maximum? No, that's the minimum mandatory sentence. Uh, we see human traffickers get 15 years. Uh, they'll get, uh, they'll get uh, house arrest for the first two or three years while their case is, is going through. Uh, that will come off their sentence. And then we've seen human traffickers get probation after as little as five years. Uh, I mean, think about it. You can get 30 years for money laundering. Why is it that if on a federal charge, you can get more years in prison for money laundering than you can for human trafficking? Now, in some states like Texas and Montana, uh, I mean, it's, it, you actually want to get a state charge because it's life in prison for a human trafficking charge. Uh, so what we're seeing, and I actually believe that this is the right, um, this is the right answer, we're seeing the states start to take this, this, this issue into their own hands um, with some supplemental funding by the federal government, and they're starting to push that forward. One of the best human trafficking task forces in the United States is the HETRA in, in Houston. It's the Human Trafficking Rescue Alliance. Uh, it's it's uh, multiple jurisdictions, dozens of jurisdictions in the in the Houston area, um, and it's it's a very much a local human trafficking task force. The feds have some involvement in it for sure, but you're looking at about a ten to one local agent to federal agent ratio 
on fighting human trafficking. And by the way, um, their full-time human trafficking analyst is actually one of my employees uh, because they they couldn't afford to hire a full-time human trafficking analyst. So we uh, we got a guy who came from uh, the the human intelligence operations side of SEAL Team Six and hired him on a full-time salary. And what he does is he hunts down human traffickers on the intel side for those law enforcement officers. But notice I said that one human trafficking task force. LA has got a decent one. New York has a decent one. Chicago's is, is up and coming. Uh, but the 80% of America is rural. And the human traffickers know that moving through rural America is the best way not to get caught. Nick, what, what do you think is appropriate punishment for a human trafficker? I think life in prison sounds pretty good to me. Nothing above that. Life is plenty is what you're thinking. Uh, yeah, I think I think life is uh, I think life is pretty good. Um, you know, beyond that, you start getting into uh, political issues that um, you, you made you made a video on this uh, that I thought was was very good for a guy in my situation um, in talking about you know various political issues. So let's just start with let's just start with life in prison. Let's get that locked in, uh, right? We know that that worked when we when we had gangs. Uh, targeting law enforcement officers, and we made you know the killing of a law enforcement officer uh, a, a life sentence. We know that that worked, so let's try that for human trafficking, and then and then let's see where that data takes us and and move move beyond that. T top states I looked at for human trafficking, I saw California, Texas, Florida, Nevada, Vegas specifically. Obviously, Vegas makes uh, some sense, but then they said the epicenter is New York City. What, what would you say, having been in this industry yourself, what, where do you see a lot of the human trafficking taking place? So human trafficking is transitory, uh, right? The, the traffickers, I mean, at the end of the day, let's remember they are, they are business people. Uh, and I don't want to say businessmen because a lot of human traffickers are women. Um, so uh, they, are, they are business people who are going to go where the market opportunity is. So New York City is not a problem right now because people have been fleeing New York City because of tax issues and, and COVID. And so you're starting to see an uptick in human trafficking activity in places like Texas, where, you know, Montana, uh, rural America, where people, where people are flooding to. And human traffickers can't get hotel rooms. Um, they can't, you know, if, if there's a big COVID lockdown, so they're going to go to the places where there isn't a COVID lockdown. Then they follow the market. God. God. So they're not as dumb as you think they are. They're, they're so, a little bit smart. I, yeah, but how smart do you have to be to say, hey, I'm not making any money in this city. Let's try the next one. Um, you know, it's, they're, they're looking at it as, as a, uh, let's say great examples, um, consumer electronics show, right? It's a market opportunity for them. You've got all kinds of people from all over the world come to Las Vegas to, you know, to, to party and they want girls at those parties and, and they want to, they want to show up. So you'll have human traffickers who will, who will leave Nebraska to go to Nevada to sell their girls in Nevada, because that's an opportunity for them. They'll sell them along the way and they might hit a couple other cities on their way back home. So, uh, so um, when you're saying some of these human traffickers are not men, they're women, Epstein Maxwell, Jelaine. Jelaine, you would put as a human trafficker. Would she categorically be a human trafficker? It's just a high-end human trafficker, right? From what I know of the case, yes. I'm not an expert on that case by any means, but, but from what I know, yes. Um, you, you, that's that's the, the misconception is that all human traffickers are men and that is not the case. Uh, I mean, many, many human traffickers are women. Many of them became human trafficking victims and then the Stockholm syndrome set in pretty bad, and they started they started essentially acting as a business manager for their human trafficker um, to get preferential treatment, uh, right? Preferential, uh, uh, you know, maybe a, maybe some freedoms, things like that. And then eventually, maybe the human trafficker goes to prison, and they just take over the business enterprise. Interesting. Um, last question, and then I'll, I'll wrap up with the, you know, one last short, this is the next topic. And then the last one, I'll wrap up with a basic question. Uh, parents, um, 
what 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 can we as parents do to um be alert be aware anticipate prevent what can we do to be smarter with this be nosy and be in your children's lives know who they're talking to know what's no know, know, know what's going on know whether or not that game that they're playing has a chat feature and i, and I talk to parents like well i'm just not good with technology and it's time to get good with technology uh, because uh, if you're going to allow your children to uh, if you're going to allow your children to to use a gaming console or to use a phone um, look at look at that as a weapon right no parent would hand their child a loaded gun and say, oh, well, I'm just not good with guns, so I don't, I don't know how to check to see if it's loaded. Tell me how a gaming console or a phone is any different, um, right? Our, our, our job as parents is to protect our children. Um, and that means protecting them from things that, that they don't understand the consequences for. If you go to our website at, at deliverfund.org, you will see a, uh, you'll see a video of a, a boy who was uh, trafficked? He was uh, he was groomed through a gaming console. Um, our legal counsel says I can't say which one, um, but he was he was uh, he was groomed through a a, uh, a very recognizable gaming console, one of the top three, uh, and the and he thought he was talking to another boy his age in another state, and then that human trafficker went you know got him to tell him over a period of months where he lived. Human trafficker then um, contacted him and said, "Hey, um, I'm with my dad up the street. Why don't you uh, Why don't you come out and say hi?" And so the boy did. Jumped in the car. Obviously, it was a it was a grown man. Took his phone. They found the phone in the the front yard of a neighbor's house and uh, took this young boy to another state. Now, luckily. One of our analysts, uh, Kara Smith. Uh, you can find her on on uh, Instagram at Kara the Huntress. Um, which is kind of our little name for her because all she she lives to hunt down human traffickers and she's a former NSA analyst. Um, she was able to find this this young boy where he was and uh, within a couple of hours and law enforcement kicked in the door of, of this guy's house and rescued the boy uh, within 48 hours. but but that that's a great example and and the father of this young boy, uh, he was an IT security specialist at a very yeah. large, no, at a very large IT security company. So he had all the right filters on his, on his router. He had all the right stuff. He was doing the right things. He just assumed that because he'd pushed the easy button for, for, you know, keeping, keeping the, you know, pornography and stuff like that out of office home internet. Um, that there was no other way that you know, these human traffickers could get these children. So you see your kids talking to somebody on a on a game, on a gaming console, or or on a phone. You know, hey, who are you talking to? What are they saying? Do you, do you really know that's them? You know, helping children understand that the person on the other side of the internet could be anybody. It could be who they who they claim to be, and it also could not. You know, my my. Uh, my other company verify, you know, we, we do all this work around fraud for investments. And, uh, and it, it shocks me how many very, very, very bright, very wealthy individuals who have made billions of dollars um, end up being defrauded by somebody just because they took their word for it. And next thing you know, they're losing tens of millions of dollars. Um, so if that can happen to uh, if that can happen to private equity firms, if that can happen to investment banks, if that can happen to uh, you know venture capital firms, it surely can happen to a teenage kid who's playing a video game. It's crazy when you're just thinking about like how they go about. By the way, do you know Jera uh, Hutchins or no? Can't say I do. No, Jera Hutchins in Dallas. You don't. Okay. She uh, she's one of those that uh, loves fighting human trafficking, and she teaches people how to get uh, licensed to carry. And she's she's phenomenal. She's uh, awesome. Phenomenal what she does. Yeah, I watched a movie years ago. I know you're not a movie guy. You're a music <laughs> guy, but you're not a movie guy. You haven't even seen the movie Jack Ryan and that Jack Ryan. No, I haven't. So, so uh, I watched this movie called Disconnect, and Disconnect was a, a great movie to show how a kid gets bullied online and this this guy's um 
father, parents go through a divorce, you know, he's just not, he's just not connected. You know, he's just so busy. I don't have any time. I don't have any time. He's actually, they're not divorced. One, the other kid is parents divorced. So this, the kids, the bullies in school find out that this kid likes this girl. So they make a fake profile and send a picture of somebody else's naked picture without the face on and said, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. So she's, they, the guy send a picture of another girl online that they got. So he then sends a picture of himself naked. The boys end up using the picture against him, share it with everybody in school because they're, you know, kids, they do stupid things. Obviously that cyber bullying, this kid, is so embarrassed to go to school that he ends up hanging himself and his sister walks in on time where he doesn't kill himself. But that has nothing to do with human trafficking, but it does. Oh, it does. Because it absolutely does. Steps, the first two, three steps where I'll show you mine if you show me yours. I recommend every parent to watch this movie because it's a very interesting movie. And the guy that's in this movie is the guy from Horrible Bosses. I don't know what the guy's name is. Jason, is it Jason Bateman? Jason, uh, uh, is that is that an actor's name? I don't know. I think that's the actor's name. Jason, Jason Bateman was in. He's done a great job. But, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think there needs to be more education on this. I saw the hotline. You know, there's a hotline for human trafficking. And, and is that mm -hmm. something you support with what they do? Is that an organization that you support? So the National Human Trafficking Hotline is a uh, is a good uh, it's a good resource, but it's the best resource is to call your local law enforcement uh, because that's where it's actually happening, right? National Human Trafficking Hotline is a hotline in D.C. Um, you know, doing the best they can from there, but you want to call where it's actually happening because, like you said, Patrick, it is speed, right? Time is of the essence in these cases. So you want to get that law enforcement officer on the ground where you see the problem involved. Uh, and, and what you brought up is, is what, uh, what is referred to as sextortion. Human traffickers use that. They, they create a profile. Some girl thinks that she's talking to some good looking guy who's a couple of years older. Um, they get a picture and then they use that to control these, to control these girls. Uh, we've actually had cases where there were teenage girls who were living at home with their parents who were being trafficked after school when their parents thought that they were at soccer practice. And all they knew was that something was not right with their daughters, but their daughter wouldn't talk about it because this trafficker was threatening to, you know, show their church or show their parents or something like that. So helping your children understand that one you can kind of survive anything, right? I mean, yes, if, if, if that naked picture of you gets, gets put on the internet, um, it, well, one, if you're underage, those platforms have a responsibility to take that, to take that down and there's legal consequences if they don't. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is um, what will happen to you if you, uh, if you cooperate with the human trafficker is far worse than anything that, that could ever happen uh, otherwise. And, and this, the last piece is for children to understand that anything they put on the internet lives forever, right? Unless you get as lucky as me and you have a government agency to, to go start scrubbing things off, right? I mean, I'm one of the few people who in their mid thirties had got a, got a fresh, fresh start on the internet. Um, that just doesn't happen. Um, so for children to understand that if you take a picture on a phone, it lives forever. If you send it, it lives forever. And eventually you have to assume that anything you do on the internet is going to end up on the front page of the Washington Post. You know, it's funny. I, I, I've never said this ever in an interview. I hope this video gets millions of views. I've, if anybody's watching you, if you know, I mean, if any of you, I've never said, I hope this video gets millions of views. I hope this interview gets millions of views and I hope people share it with other parents and give the thumbs up everything that the algorithms work in a favor of you to putting this all over the place because people need to get ed educated uh, just in the last hour and 15 minutes, however long we've been going minus the conversation you and I had offline. Uh, I've gotten smarter and I, I appreciate your time. I appreciate everything you uh, shared with us and uh, uh, we will leave the link below to both of your companies. Obviously the deliver being at the top and uh, we'll put the other one as well. 
and um, how people can find you. They can find you easily through your website, right? Is that is that the best way to find you through your website? Yeah, you find me through the website. Um, right. I'm on all the social media platforms uh, at Deliver Fund Nick. And uh, LinkedIn is the one that I'm the most active on. Uh, and thank you, Patrick, for, for helping us uh, shine a light on this issue. I mean, this is, it, it's a team effort and everyone's got a, got a part to play. And, and so thank you for that. I think you play a very important role. And I hope more people get inspired to do what you do once they leave the military, because we need uh, people like you. And I hope uh, any government officials or anybody that's involved in politics who watches this content uh, also has the courage to bring it up to folks in power who see value in this. So eventually the budget for this goes into the billions, I think 10, 20, 30 billion to eliminate this, at least in America, and then eventually gradually work internationally. Once again, thank you, thank you for your time. And uh, 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 very, very, very good, very good interview with you the last hour and a half. I really enjoyed it. My brain is going a million miles an hour. Thanks again, Nick. Thank you, Patrick. I've not asked you this before, but I'm asking you right now, and hopefully you will do this as a value tainer. Please share this video. Text it to people, hit the thumbs up button, share it whatever way you can for other people to see it, for the algorithms to be on our favor, because this is not a message about how you make millions, how you make billions, how you become successful. It's not entertainment. This is purely something that's about education and awareness. So I'm asking you, share it with any parent that you know and say, just watch this video. Get a paper and pen out. You're going to want to pay attention to this one here. And having said that, if you enjoyed this interview and you learn from it, I have a real life story of somebody that experienced this. Her name is Yanomi Park. If you've never seen that interview, click over here to watch that. And uh, hopefully together we can create more awareness of this. And even if we make this much of a dent and this leads to helping out 20 kids, 100 kids, 5,000 kids, 100,000 kids, we did our job. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.